Jesus' name dearly beloved. The purpose of Jesus' parables is not to condemn sinners, but to highlight the radical, undeserved nature of God's saving love for poor, miserable sinners, for every one of us in Christ crucified. But in highlighting and underscoring that love, the Lord's parables also catch you and me in the misguided, sinful cleverness of our own hearts. For example, how easy to hear today's parable and jump to the conclusion, oh, okay, no worries. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Just be a good person, a good Samaritan, and eternal life is mine. Easy, right? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. But how foolish and utterly detached that hope is from the love you and I actually see and experience in our own hearts and lives. Love those who do not love you, who despise you, who would consider it a sin and act against God if they ever did good to you, risk life and limb and do not consider the cost at all to be a neighbor to everyone, no matter who they may be, even someone who is your enemy? That's what it meant for that Samaritan in today's gospel lesson, and that's what it would mean, exactly what it would mean for you and me if eternal life would be ours because of our love. And not just our love for those of our own choosing, and who is my neighbor, as if there is wiggle room under the law for us to hide behind our own prejudices and hatreds. No, that's too easy. Love for those who are of God's choosing, meaning love for anyone and everyone out there, anyone and everyone whose path you happen to cross in this life. Not, and who is my neighbor, but who am I neighbor to? Answer, according to the law, everyone. And truth be told, you and I don't even love those closest to us like that, let alone our enemies. We're like the sinners, Oded, addresses in today's Old Testament lesson. Have you not sins of your own against the Lord your God? Yes, we do. We all do. We all have our own sins against the Lord our God. God knows full well how we treat each other. Those nearest and dearest to us as well as those who are not. And God also knows even if you and I refuse to believe it, all our sins against each other, against those around us, no matter who they may be, are also, in fact, our first and foremost sins against God himself. All sin is actually sin against God. We can try to sanctify our sin, our hatreds and prejudices by saying, well, what do you expect? Some people deserve what comes their way, not me, of course. But others for sure. And that person, he doesn't deserve any mercy or help or good works, at least not from me anyways. And nobody in their right mind would ever think otherwise. In fact, it shows good judgment on my part to look the other way and just pass on by. Yes, our love condemns us. Our own love cannot, will not save us from the wrath of God. It's why the law was written. In fact, that's the, that's the point St. Paul is making today when he writes, why then the law? If the law can't save, can't bring me to God, can't produce God's own righteousness in any of us, why then the law? It was added, says St. Paul, because of transgression. It was added, says St. Paul. The law was never plan A, as if it can save anyone. But it was added, as if to point us all back to plan A. And to show us our desperate need for plan A to save us from God's wrath. Plan A being this right here. 
Jesus Christ and him crucified for you and for me, for all of us upon the cross. That's the only love that's going to save any poor, miserable sinner. The only love that's going to save you and me. The only love that can save you and me. God's love for all of us in Christ Jesus. No poor, miserable sinner excluded from the promise of Jesus' death for them upon the cross. It, the law, was added because of or on account of transgressions, not because of or on account of righteousness. Because believe it or not, the law has nothing at all to do with righteousness before God. At least not with any righteousness that is going to save you and me from our sins, from the way you and I treat one another. With his law, says Luther, God is sending his own Hercules from heaven to smash any and every presumption in us of our own righteousness before God. We do not love God, and we do not love our neighbor. That is the verdict, is the judgment of God's law. In short, you and I are loveless creatures, loveless sinners in the eyes of the law. And it, the law, was put in place through angels by an intermediary. The people of God didn't like hearing the law either when God first spoke it. It wasn't just the thunder and the lightning at Mount Sinai or the fire and smoke or the darkness and the earth quaking under their feet that they didn't like, but even the language of the law itself, raw and unfiltered and straightforward as God spoke it to them, they didn't like it. It scared them all because it exposed them all, showed them for who they really were in the eyes of their God, Un holy sinners like everyone else in this world. Unholy sinners who had lost any and every claim upon God and his love for them like everyone else in this world. Beware of those who are not frightened by the law that God himself speaks. Who talk about God's law as an easy thing. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. It's demand the sort of love it requires from you and me of salvation would be ours because of our love. No. The law is meant to call us all to repentance by pointing out how loveless we truly are in God's judgment. It's why the first word out of my mouth every Sunday is the name given to you and me in baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. How else would you and I dare to be here and approach God unless we were first clothed in his name? That is, first clothed with Christ, our Samaritan. Then, first thing after that, we confess how sinful we really are, ever offending God and justly deserving his punishment. We are not a particularly fabulous group to be a part of, and we admit that freely. Stick around, and sooner or later, you'll discover that yourself. Someone will offend you. Someone will hurt your feelings. Someone will let you down. Won't be there for you the way you want them to be, the way you need them to be. Will sin against you, showing you no love. Doesn't make it right, like I said last Sunday, just makes it real. Welcome to the club, folks, sinners only. What's our hope then? Where is the love that's going to save unholy sinners, the likes of you and me, loveless creatures? This love right here, God's love. For you and me, God's love for all us unholy sinners in Christ, crucified.
for us. No poor sinner excluded from this love. Love that proclaims and promises God is now your neighbor too. No matter who you are, even if you are his biggest enemy. Chief of sinners though you be, okay, fine. Good confession. But right here, upon the cross, God himself has proclaimed and promised and given himself to you now, now and forever as your neighbor, neighbor to love you, neighbor to save you, and neighbor to give you eternal life now. Your Samaritan. I love how our translation, the English Standard Version, even capitalizes Samaritan in verse 33. They get it right. Our Samaritan, Jesus, love that carries our own sin and guilt to the cross for us, for all of us, all of it. Love that sacrifices itself for our prejudices and our hatreds, all of them. Love that owns our own unholinesses as if they were its own to pay for, to suffer and die for. Love that is washed over you and me every day now in baptism, cleansing all our sins away. Love that is spoken to us in the absolution and in the sermon, promising our sins, all of our sins, to Jesus now, not to us. Love that, like oil and wine, are poured into us poor, miserable sinners at the Holy Supper, as Jesus promises them, you and me, for you, for the forgiveness of sins. As if to say, I got this now. I got you now. I got him now. I got her now. All of you now. Even if you are my enemy. In fact, according to my father's own law, that's the only group there is for me to love. God's enemies. You. Love to the loveless shown that they might lovely be. Yes, as you and I will sing at Holy Communion today, but even more. Love to the loveless shown that you and I, the loveless ones, may have a love to hope in now, to believe in to lift us up from our own hatreds and prejudices and to find salvation and eternal life in love that is Jesus and his death for us, for all of us, upon the cross. You, you mean in, in this parable, you and I are the one on the side of the road left for dead, no hope, but for love from outside our own hearts to save us? Yes, we are. God's law and our own sin tells us we are. Thank God then for a love that really is radical and undeserved. Thank God for our Samaritan, for Jesus and his sacrifice for us upon the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.